Welcome back to the Lex Files. This is Lex Benjamin. This is number 14, and I'm talking about Boltzmann brains. What are they? Do they have any meaning in our lives? Do they matter? Should we even care, right? So Boltzmann brains are a concept keeping in line with this whole notion of what is the nature of our existence? What is the nature of, of our reality outside of our conscious experience, right? You know, where we've talked about, are we in a simulation? Um, you know, we've talked about solipsism, you know, are we the only minds that exist? And we've now we're talking about Boltzmann brains and really what it is, is a disembodied brain with the experience of all of this, the, of reality, of a life, of memories, of pain, of family, of attachments and of a physical universe. It's a disembodied brain with the, the experience of a physical universe where there is no physical universe as we see it, a highly ordered one. And it's all coming from a man named, you know, Ludwig Boltzmann. He died in 1908. 1908, I believe, um, 1906, maybe he noticed he was really a big contributor, really influential in the understanding of in the laws of thermodynamics. Right. Especially the second law, I believe. So there he looked around and he noticed there's a high degree of order in this universe for something too much order for something that supposedly came about via random fluctuations in a vacuum. You don't get ra random fluctuations should not create order that is lasting and consistent like this now from a quantum mechanical standpoint um if you know from a newtonian standpoint yes it's fine um this makes a lot of sense but as we get deeper and deeper in our understanding of reality and the physical world quantum mechanics does not necessarily say that things should stay cohesive and uniform like this and when I, when you think about the universe and you think it might be chaotic and dis, disorganized and dis heck no this universe is highly ordered especially at this point in its life you the fact that you exist means that it's highly ordered the fact that we see galaxies everywhere we look, we see stars, solar systems, we have order to a degree that is an almost impossible. But what it really is, is next to impossible, highly improbable for something that came about via random fluctuations. Now, the reason it's not impossible is because if we have a closed universe, if we have a yeah, a closed system, a closed universe, and it is infinite, then all the particles, all the quantum bits will realize all positions and, and, and uh, I guess, superpositions and systems in a quantum system to bring about all states of a physical reality. And this would be one of them. Now, would it probably happen at the beginning that the, the very birth, essentially 13.8 years into the life of a universe, what we believe it is anyway, that it's going to go on for hundreds of trillions or who knows, maybe longer, you know? So why now is it likely that now is the point in this universe's life where we have this degree of order? It doesn't seem to make sense from that standpoint. So what you posit, what you put forth instead of a universe out of random fluctuations, what you put forth, that is more, it's a more parsimonious explanation, a more simple explanation. You put forth that, the random fluctuations are much, much more likely to give rise to a disembodied brain with the experience of a universe than an entire highly ordered universe with all this matter, all the planets, all the galaxies, all the conscious minds, all of the 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 life. Right. At least that we see on this planet and likely on other planets. Right. That is just highly unlikely. So. Like I said, Boltzmann didn't call. OK, Boltzmann didn't call these Boltzmann brains. This was not his. That was not a brain, a brainstorm by Boltzmann. It was a, a, a physicist named Sean Carroll was giving credit to uh, another physicist named Sir Arthur Edgington. Um, in 1931, I believe he coined the term Boltzmann brain and Sean Carroll. I'll trust him because he's my favorite physicist right now. It's, I'm really, <laughs> really liking most of the stuff he's saying. Um you know, I'm, I'm, I'm watching less sports now. I'm watching, you know, I'm watching physicists like they're like their first round draft picks. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm really into, you know, science right now. So, um, he, these people come, what they're, what we're looking at, Boltzmann and Carol, what we're all looking at is potentially a universe of mind. Um, and you, that would mean that you are not you. You are not you as you think you are. You do not have a body. And we're not, they don't have to be physical like, oh, it birthed the human brain. And that's why you have a experience of you. No, we're just talking about matter capable of cognition, thought, intelligence, and consciousness. If it, if, if consciousness is realizable and emergent property of physical matter and, and that's possible, then it makes perfect sense. And it's totally plausible how we can get 
a disembodied brain. It may not be anything like in the brain that we know, but it's just physical matter capable of consciousness. It's totally plausible that we can get that. And if you can get that, then you can get a brain with ready made experiences, history past, hurt feelings, hopes, dreams, you know, sight, sounds, all of these things. And that would be the experience of the entire universe for that conscious mind. Now, Sean Carroll and other people take issue with this due to the arrow of time, the hand of time, the arrow of time, entropy. It seems like um, entropy is, I'm going to explain it really briefly and I'm going to explain it incorrectly for, um, I guess, utility sake, right? So entropy is going from a state of high order to a state of low order. That is the arrow of time that we see in this universe right now. Um, entropy is not really about that. It's just about microstates or you can think of it as, you know, chaos versus order, right? So, you know, high entropy is high chaos and low entropy is low is, is, is high order. This universe right now is in a pretty highly ordered state. And the best example that I can think of, um, you could think of a, a room full of gas. You can take each particle or molecule in that room, rearrange those, and you walk into that same room of air. Just think about the room, room full of air. That room is always jostling and changing. Do you ever notice? No, that's because it has high entropy. You do not care what arrangement that the molecules are in a room as long as they're in a room so you can breathe, right? Same thing with the sand, uh, sand castle on the beach, right? You can build the most intricate sand castle in the world. It's made out of sand, but that specific arrangement that gives the beauty, the the detail, the, the visual appeal of your creation, um, come back a day or two later, and that sand castle will be in high entropy. It'll be in high entropy state. It'll be a pile of sand or will return completely to the beach. And what we know about a beach is unlike the sand castle that you can't take one chunk of a sand castle and then stick it on another top without destroying the sand castle or the, the work of art, right? But you can take a chunk of beach sand and put it on beach sand and put it on another part of the beach and still have a beach and no one would ever know the, di the difference. You can take sand from a beach on one part of the world and take it to another and almost likely no one would ever know this the difference so when you can rearrange something in a number of different ways and it's in you're indifferent to the result and then it is high has high entropy now you and your body you can't rearrange those in too many different ways and still function or live so you will have low entropy you're highly ordered and that's when you look at a universe that's highly ordered what you see is an arrow of time now sean carroll and people are saying well if this came about via random fluctuations then why is it that we have such a, you know, these brains come about? And then why do we have such a strong arrow of time? Why is it that these brains are having this conscious experience of this? Why is it that, I mean, you just wouldn't get an arrow of time as we see it in this universe from random fluctuations. So there has to, there has to be something else, you know, they believe that would, I guess, let us know that there's something else in play other than just random fluctuations in the creation of this universe. If it was just random fluctuations, then an arrow of time, you know, entropy would not have such sway. What you would see and what we know is that the physical laws of the universe are time invariant, meaning that the universe should be able to run and it can run either way, forward in time or backward. It does not matter from the laws of physics. There's nothing about the laws of physics that says that you can't reverse all these processes and you know, take a broken egg and make it whole again. It's just highly unlikely due to the way the universe seems to be unfolding, which is from order to disorder. Now it could be going the opposite way. Everything, our lives and everything could be uh, played in reverse and we would not see anything wrong. We'd be like, we would call that forward. We would call that, you know, just time moving forward, but it would be the opposite to us. Right? So that causes problems for a lot of people. So, are we Boltzmann brains? That's what we're going to get to. Are we Boltzmann brains? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, what is this? But the notion, what all of this means at the end of the day, what all of this spells is just another recipe for humility, for taking our hubris level down. We cannot be certain what lies outside of our mind. And I think that's what I'm really getting at. We can't be certain what lies outside of our mind. We can't be certain. Um, what the nature of reality of the physical reality, especially is outside of our conscious mind. We have senses, we have all of this, but other than like a solipsistic believer or thinker, other than the fact that we exist, nothing else can be known to a certainty. Um, we could very well be brains, disembodied brains floating in a vacuum um, with the experience of all of our thoughts, feelings, hopes, dreams, everything else. Um, what I, what I find more plausible, more likely, and 
and more interesting is the fact that we do live in a physical universe, at least we have the experience of it, and we know that there's plenty of gas clouds out there, there's plenty of collections of high entropy matter, and given enough time, I definitely believe in a nebula somewhere that matter can coalesce and form something like a conscious mind for the briefest of moments, right? And to think that right now there's a trillion minds out there disembodied with secrets in 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 answers and solutions to mankind's greatest ills, problems, and fears, but can never communicate that because, you know, they will play out, you know, maybe an entire life in their mind. It's just, that's interesting to me. And we could be those. I could be, you could be, I could be. But where we get back to is it does not matter, really. Does it mean anything? Yeah, it's interesting. We, it means that we can't be that certain about our existence about our reality not to a certainty to say this is a physical this is a physical reality i touch it i know it well this isn't reliable what's inside of here not the brain i'm not pointing at the brain but the conscious experience is is the only reliable thing we have this can be altered all of our senses can be altered can be played with can be totally circumvented and bypassed so you can be fed information and experience potentially and probably almost certainly be fed experiences that have no physical reality. And we know that we do this all the time by creating illusions, fantasies, things that never existed in our, in reality, in the physical reality, but we have them playing in experiences completely real in our minds. So we're going to, we should definitely take all of these things, solipsism, um, ancestor civilizations, you know, living in a simu, you know, are we living in a simulated reality? Those from brains, all of that should take our hubris down a little bit about our certainty about what all this is and about what we are. That's what all of this should be. Like I said, we're going to I use we should be using science to keep us grounded so we don't get too far out there. If you don't. I mean, science obviously got got us to bolts and brands and understanding of our physical universe would lead someone into the line of thinking of asking these questions and pondering these possibilities. Right. But what we don't want to do is get so far out there um, that we just we're just making up stuff. So we use we're going to use science and I'm going to use science and I think we should all use science to stay grounded but also not restrict possibilities, especially when they aren't impossible. If something's not impossible, then it's, it's plausible. It might not be probable, but it's plausible, right? So the notion, you cannot dismiss some of these things f- totally outright. Now, are, you know, the whole solipsistic belief of we are we the only mind in existence? I mean, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what to make of that. I don't know where you go from there. But are we Boltzmann brains? I don't know where to go from there in, in either. Also, we're going to continue to live our lives as we have because the consequences of us being wrong about being Boltzmann brains is severe. So we, with all of these things, we live as if they weren't true. But at the back of our minds, I think what we should, the main and only thing we should do is to remember and remind ourselves that we don't know anything to a certainty. <laughs> Our universe is crazy. It's wacky. It's weird. It's highly interesting. And us as human beings, man, um, we probably should take it down a notch and be a little bit more humble. I'm not saying being humble for some virtue thing, but just in our approach to our in our approach to each other, mainly in our environment, in our world, where we act like we are so certain, where we're so confident about how to proceed, about what's right, about what's what's not right. Man, we don't know the nature of our physical reality. We really could be floating out in space somewhere with the experience of watching YouTube, of listening to podcasts and of pondering, <laughs> you know, the imponderables. Right. So. That's pretty much it. You know, be calm, be be cool, be humble, but keep an open mind and and, you know, but also don't be too wacky and and, and accepting and believing whatever just because it sounds interesting or or you want to believe it. Like if you want to believe you're a Boltzmann brain and none of this is consequential, well, that's fine. I, I'm pretty confident that if you go in about a reckless path that you're going to slowly realize that, hey, being whether I am a Boltzmann brain or not, this sucks. You know what I've done. You know, so we want to be cautious and careful when we move forward and not dismiss the consequences of the fact that this may be just a true plain physical reality and everything in it matters as far as, you know, what happens to us. So, I mean, I just think it's interesting. I think it's weird. And I think it's kind of, I don't know if sad, but it's sad that we cannot access these conscious minds. There's likely geniuses, um, I'm just 
genius thoughts and, and, and ideas and, and workarounds to, like I said, we could probably solve all of our mind, all of our, uh, all of our technical and, and societal issues. If we could talk to a few dozen of these bolts, the genius Boltzmann brains coming in, popping into existence and popping out, out there in the cosmos, but we can't. So we might be, it. we might be them. So maybe that's the reason we can't. So that's it. Um, this is Boltzmann Brains. I will keep with this line of thinking for a little bit. Consciousness. Um, next, I'll talk about the self. Then I'll talk about why the self, how the self can be damaged, why solitary confinement is so terrible for the conscious mind and the brain, um, things like that. So I appreciate you watching, tuning in, subscribe, leave me a comment um, if you have any questions, especially. Um, I'll put a link in the description to PBS Space Times video if you want to know more about the physics of Boltzmann Brains. Um, it's a pretty good video. Uh, like the video, subscribe. Also, housekeeping, all these little things at the end, right? Uh, yeah, definitely leave me a comment if there's a topic that you, if you've seen where I'm going with this, if there's a topic that you are interested in, just leave me a comment and maybe I'll get to that sooner than later then. But other than that, I appreciate you watching. Uh, tune in for the next one. Have a great day and goodbye. Um, Boltzmann brain. <laughs> goodbye.